Good morning. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to Trinity for this very special occasion, the confirmation of our eighth grade students. Welcome also to those of you who are joining us online today. We're glad that you could join us for this special service. The theme of our service today is mercy. In his tremendous mercy and love, God has made sinners like us righteous in his sight through faith in Jesus Christ, our, his Son, our Savior. In response to God's mercy, we praise and thank him, and we also strive to share that same kind of show, that same kind of mercy toward others. That's the, uh, those are the main th thoughts you'll see in our service. The order of service uh, that we're following is printed out for you in your service folder. It'll also be available on the screen if you'd like to follow along there. We begin then with our first hymn, hymn 283, Speak, O Savior, I am listening. Please stand for worship. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our epistle lesson this morning is recorded in Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome, Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 18. In these verses, Paul talks about the faith of Abraham and how God credited righteousness to him, as he also does with us. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Here ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and entrust, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Alleluia. Please stand then for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at the ninth verse. In these verses, Jesus makes it clear that he came to save sinners, so he wasn't afraid or embarrassed to associate with sinners. Like the Pharisees, it would be the height of arrogance on our part to think that we are somehow righteous on our own and don't need a Savior. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Here ends our gospel lesson. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll continue with our confession of faith. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated and we'll continue with our next hymn. Right. 
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is the epistle lesson from Romans chapter 4. I'm going to reread a few of the verses beginning at verse 22. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness from God, your fellow children of God and descendants of Abraham, It isn't too often that you see a credit on your bank statement. More often than not, it's, you know, nothing more than the interest that is accrued on your account. 78 cents, a dollar 33, two dollars and 15 cents, woo! Hardly anything to get excited about. But what if you open your bank statement one month and you notice a credit of over a million dollars? What would you do then? Would you fall out of your chair? Would you immediately go to the bank, withdraw the money, and then immediately leave the country? I think most of us would just assume it was a mistake. We'd probably call up the bank that very same day and say something like, "Uh, yes, um, so I was uh, looking at my bank statement today, and and, uh, you know, there must be some mistake. You see, I, there was a credit on my statement for like over a million dollars, and well, that can't be right. I've never had that much money. As we open the pages of Scripture this morning, we notice something just as incredible, just as amazing. Here in Romans chapter 4, Paul tells us about something that God credits to us, something more than worth more than a million dollars, worth even more than a billion dollars. 
something called righteousness. Is that a mistake? No, that's actually the good news that Paul has to share with us this morning. Righteousness is something that God gives to you and gives to me. It's ours through faith. And it's ours because of Jesus. Righteousness is one of those big words you learn about in catechism class, right? Confirmation students? It has the basic meaning of being right with God. Naturally, then, it also has the idea of being holy like a God, and so is often used as a, a synonym for holiness. Think of the words, for example, that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5. He said, Unless your righteousness, that is, your holiness, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So whether or not a person is able to go to heaven depends on whether or not he possesses righteousness. The Bible is also clear on how a person obtains righteousness. It's by faith. Unfortunately, many people nowadays don't believe that. Many people nowadays have their own ideas about righteousness and how it is obtained. Many, in fact, don't believe it's even necessary, that you even need to be righteous or holy in order to get to heaven. They share the same view that Michael J. Fox shared once on an episode of Family Ties years ago. The weeks leading up to that particular episode, he lost a very close friend of his. And so in that particular show, it, it kind of highlighted the, the emotional struggles that we, he was having with that loss. Toward the end of the show, he, he started talking about God. And, and what he said went something like this. I believe there is a God, yes, but not an angry God. I believe he's a kind, loving God, kind of like a warm-hearted grandpa or, or like your best friend. And I believe he is a God who accepts people just the way they are. Some of what he said is true, of course. God is a kind and loving God, a God of infinite kindness and love. But He is also a holy and just God, which is something they tend to forget. As a holy and just God, God cannot just overlook people's sins or not punish people for the sins they've committed. That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be just on His part. Another common misconception when it comes to righteousness is that you can acquire it on your own. And you can make yourself righteous in God's sight by living a good life and doing lots of good things. In fact, that there was an elderly lady once who, that's pretty much what she told me. When I asked her if she was sure she would go to heaven when she died, she said, yes. I mean, you know, I've lived a good life. I've always tried to help people when they need help. And I can't imagine that God wouldn't let me into heaven. Her comments aren't surprising, are they? It's what we all like to do. We all like to focus on the good things that we have done. And we think God should do that too. That He should just look at the, the good things that we have done in our lives. All the times that we were good and kind and, and helpful to others. All right. But what about those other times? The times we don't like to talk about. The times that we were not very kind or loving or patient or helpful to others. See, the truth is, righteousness is required for a person in order to get to heaven. God is holy. And if we're going to live with God in heaven someday, then we need to be holy too. Problem is, we're not. Problem is, we're sinful. It's the way we were born. And it isn't hard to see if if you take an honest look at our lives. Remember that argument you had with your spouse and some of the nasty things you said? Or remember that fight you had with your brother or sister and some of the really nice things you called each other? Or remember that party you went to, that graduation party with your friends? You weren't old enough to be drinking, but that didn't stop you, did it? You see, we sin all the time. 
So how can we possibly claim to be righteous? How could we even imagine that we could be righteous on our own? It, it's not possible. We, we've all fallen short of that. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in the previous chapter. He says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have to be, together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So how do you obtain righteousness, then you might ask? How do you acquire the righteousness and holiness that you need in order to live with God in heaven? Well, there is a way. God's way. That's by faith. As Paul states in verse 28 of chapter 3, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Righteousness is not something that you acquire or do on your own. It's something that God gives to us by faith. As proof of that, Paul cites the example of Abraham, which brings us to chapter 4. In these verses, Paul talked about the promise that God had given to Abraham, the promise that one day he would have a son, and through that son, many, many descendants in the future, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Paul also points out the reasons that Abraham had to doubt God's promise. For one thing, he was almost 100 years old already, and his body was as good as dead. For another, his wife Sarah was 90 years old. She was well past the age of childbearing and had never had any children. And yet, instead of being filled with doubt, Abraham continued to believe. He trusted that God would keep his promise and he would have a son. So Paul says in verse 22, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Through faith, Abraham possessed righteousness. Through faith, Abraham was right with God and had the righteousness and holiness he needed in order to live with God in heaven. Same is true for us. Notice what Paul says in the next two verses. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. You and I acquire righteousness the same way Abraham did, not by working for it, not by buying it, but by faith. Trust in God and his promises. The Bible is also very clear about the reason for our being righteous, the cause of our righteousness, why we are righteous. It's not because of us, not because of the wonderful life we've lived and all the good things we've done. It's because of Jesus. He's the one who earned it. Paul reminds us of that in verse 25. He says, He was delivered over to death for our sins. The reason Jesus suffered and died on the cross was not because of some terrible crime he had committed. The reason he died on the cross was because of the crimes we had committed. All the times we broke his commands and sinned against him. By suffering the penalty for those crimes, Jesus made it possible for God to forgive us. If Jesus hadn't died on the cross, God could not have forgiven our sins because they wouldn't have been paid for. But that's the point. Our sins have been paid for fully, completely by Jesus. So God can and has forgiven them. Jesus also obtained righteousness for us by living a, a holy life. He never got in a fight with his brothers or sisters. He never made faces behind his mom and dad's backs. He never said, you know, nasty things uh, when some guy on a camel cut him off in the freeway. No. He always did the right thing. Always said the right thing. He was truly holy and righteous. And that righteousness is the righteousness that God credits to you and me. One of our hymns says it like this. Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are. 
my glorious dress. Mid flaming worlds and these arrayed with joy shall I lift up my head. You know, that, that sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? That God actually takes Jesus' righteousness and credits it to our account? I mean, can we be sure of that? Can we be certain that God considers us to be righteous and holy because of Jesus? Sure can. Take another look at verse 25. He, referring to Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. In order to grasp what Paul is really saying there, you need to remember that the word for means the same thing in both halves of the sentence. So in the first half where it says that he was delivered over to death for our sins, it means because of our sins. Our sins were the reason that Jesus suffered and died. But then also in the second half of that sentence, when it says he was raised to life for our justification, it means because of our justification. Because we have been justified. Because God has declared us to be not guilty. That's one of the reasons Jesus' resurrection is so important. So vital to our Christian faith and why it's so, so comforting for us. You see, if Jesus had failed in his work as our Savior, or if God had not accepted his payment for our sins, he would have stayed dead. He never would have come back to life. But he did. He, on the third day, did come back to life, proving that he was victorious, proving that God had accepted his payment for our sins, proving that God had declared us to be guiltless in his sight, Proving that you and I are righteous in the eyes of God. So I know the economy has been kind of tough on farmers in the last few years, and many of them are struggling. So let's say that you are one of those farmers. And let's say that you still owed something like $250,000 on your farm, and you hadn't been able to make a payment in months. So you were a bit anxious. You were getting letters from the bank. You didn't know what you were going to do. You were afraid the bank was going to foreclose on you. But then one day out of the blue, a friend of yours gave you, not loaned you, but gave you the money. All $250,000. All the money you needed to pay off your debt. Would you be grateful to your friend? course you would. Would you try your best to show your friend how thankful you were? Of course you would. That's the same way you and I feel toward God. Every day is another opportunity. Every day is an opportunity for us to express our gratitude and thanks to our loving and merciful God who has credited to us what we could never acquire on our own so that we can live with him in heaven. Righteousness. It's yours by faith. It's yours because of Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by speaking the words of the song, Create in Me, in your service folder. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. You may be seated. We will not be uh, passing the collection plates as part of the service. Uh, collection plates are in the back. If you uh, miss them on the way in, you certainly can catch them on your way out. There are also uh, instructions on the screen if you'd like to uh, make a contribution through online giving.
Then I'd invite our confirmands to please come forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear child. You now have the privilege of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? If so, then answer, I do. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? If so, then answer, I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? If so, then answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the word of God? If so, then answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? If so, then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful in the use of the word and sacrament, and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as long as you live? If so, then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him on behalf of these confirmands that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in them. Let us therefore bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these sons and daughters of yours to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in giving them both hearts to believe and mouths to confess his saving name. Enable them to bring forth the fruits of faith and to continue steadfast and victorious until the, the day comes when all who have fought the good fight of fight, faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what we as a con Christian congregation have here asked our Heavenly Father to confer on all of you, we now ask him to give each of you individually. This end. Dylan Ryan Jur Jurison. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light.
for my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you, keep you by his grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Brian Joseph Bauman. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10 May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you, keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Cooper James Bubaltz God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you, keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Jacob Christopher Bubaltz. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Okay, then please switch. Sage Sawyer Vinkemeyer. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Psalm 23, verse 1. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you, keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Kiera Jean Wires. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, verse 9. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you, and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you, keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Jack Ryan Heyman, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Dylan Thomas Meyer. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16. May God the Father who created you, God the Son who redeemed you and God the Holy Spirit who sanctified you Keep you by his grace until life everlasting. Amen. Your church now invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communion at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given to you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Bless and keep you. Amen. All right, you may return to your seats, and then I'll ask the congregation to please stand for prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, you are holy and righteous, but we have to admit that we are not. We have often sinned and done what is wrong in your sight. And if our righteousness and our salvation depended on us, we would be hopelessly, hopelessly lost and doomed to suffer your eternal wrath and punishment. But blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered in the blood of Jesus. Blessed is the person whose sin you do not count against them. In your mercy, forgive our many sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Comfort our hearts with the assurance that our sins are all forgiven because of Jesus. And through faith in him, we stand before you holy and righteous. 
We praise and thank you, Lord, for leading Miss Maria Reese to accept our call to serve as our 7th and 8th grade teacher for the coming school year. Guide and bless her efforts as she begins preparations to begin her ministry to your people here at Trinity. We also ask your blessing, Lord, on parents and especially fathers today, that they may be good and godly leaders for their families. May they teach their children to love you with all their hearts, to practice virtue, to follow you in their daily lives, and to serve others out of love for you. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Hear us, Father, and grant our request for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus, in whose name we also pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, and said, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. In a moment, I'm going to have the uh, confirmands come up, and they're going to con uh, be, uh, commune first as a group. Uh, but before we do that, I'll give some words of instruction for our members and other Wells members who are going to be joining us for communion this morning. So the ushers are going to usher you up in a single file line down the center aisle. Um, those on the right can peel off to the uh, tables on the right. Those on the left can peel off to the tables on the left. When you come to the first table, uh, the communion wafers are in little individual paper cups. 
Uh, you can take one of those, pause for a, a moment while you eat the wafer, then you can continue on to the next uh, table where the individual cups with the wine. Again, you can pause here while you take one and, and, and drink the wine and then continue over to the side where there's a receptacle where you can place both of the cups. And then you can return to your uh, pew down the side aisles. So confirmands, please uh, come on up and we'll, we'll com commune you first. Both sides. T just take one and wait. Just take one and wait. Wait, guys, just wait. Just wait. All right, take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Okay, then go ahead and get one of the individual cups of wine. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Be filled with joy. Your sins are all forgiven. Amen. Can we turn? Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may the true body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace, be filled with joy. 
Your sins are all forgiven. Amen. We bow our heads in prayer. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude with our closing hymn. Good morning once again and welcome to all of you. As uh, mentioned in uh, the prayers this morning, Ms. Maria Reese has accepted our call to be our 7th and 8th grade teacher. She sent a letter uh, last evening and I'd like to read that for you. She writes, Dear members of Trinity, from the information I have received and the conversations I have had with church and school staff, it is clear that sharing Christ's love and words and actions is the foundation of the ministry of Trinity. After learning more about this ministry and evaluating my own abilities and interests, through prayerful consideration, I have decided to accept the call to teach grades 7 and 8 at Trinity Lutheran School. 
I look forward to serving the school families and I'm excited about being part of the education of the students. In Christ's service, Miss Maria Reese. So uh, please keep her in your prayers as uh, she's going to be beginning preparations now to move here and, and be begin serving here. Uh, I believe she's going to be trying to uh, make a trip here later this week. So if you happen to have a uh, line on potential housing for her, uh, please speak to my myself or uh, Mr. Whitney. Um, there will be a voters meeting next week Sunday. That'll be at 1030. Again, 1030 next week Sunday. And then to all the dads, I wish you all a very blessed Father's Day. Uh, we're not going to usher you out this morning because I know a number of the families want to stay and uh, take pictures, so you're just free to go as you choose. <laughs>